I'm going to die, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to die. If that wasn't hard enough to hear, then they, they have to hear that one of them's going to betray him. And they all begin to wonder which one that is. And, and then to top it all off, he says, one of you is going to deny knowing me. And so I want you to just kind of get uh, the, the, the picture here of the stress uh, that these men are under at this moment. And then Jesus begins in what we're going to read tonight in John 14 in verse number 27. And he says to them, peace. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you, before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. I'm going to pause right here before I read the last verse, which will serve as our text tonight. The hour of Christ's sacrifice has come. He's been ministering now for around three years upon the earth. And ever since the first day that he ever stood and read from Isaiah 61 and told the congregation that the word of God had been fulfilled in their ears, uh, they were trying to kill him. It was always a conspiracy against the Lord, but it never could come to pass because His hour was not yet come. Jesus, in a final statement, before they leave the upper room to go to the garden, He reveals to them that His hour was now come. He said, I'm not going to be able to talk much with you after we leave from here because the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Now then, the last verse is what we want to preach on tonight. Jesus said, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. I want to preach tonight on the mission of Christ in one verse. The mission of Christ in one verse. And we'll find that His mission is our mission. We will not go to a literal cross to be crucified as He was. Because that was a one-time transaction. And he'll never come again to do that, nor will he ever require us to do that. But the mission of Christ that he revealed to these men in verse number 31 is our mission. The mission of Christ in one verse. Let's pray together. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing upon the work of Brother Worth Johnson and his wife and the folks at Victory Baptist Press in Milton, Florida. Lord, help them to fulfill the mission that you've given them. We ask, Lord, that you would provide the, the funds and provide the paper and provide the manpower and the equipment that is necessary to get the Word of God into the hands of people who have never received it. Our Father, tonight we pray that we'll give attentive ears and attentive hearts to what thus saith the Word of God about the mission that you came to fulfill and the mission that you left behind for us to fulfill while we are here on this earth. Help us to hear what you have to say to us tonight, dear Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask for your filling and anointing to preach this message. 
I ask this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Amen. Everything that Jesus did upon the earth in the years of His life pointed in one way or the other to the mission, the specific mission that He came to fulfill. And that was to die, to suffer and to die on the cross, to pay for the sins of the world, to pay the ransom price that sin demands. Well, the wages of sin is death. That was the price He came to pay. And the Bible tells us that in so doing that, in paying the wages for the sins of the world, He would bring into effect the new covenant in His blood. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in, John's, uh, in Romans 6 and 23, we find the mission of Christ. The last verse of John 14 here, verse number 31, surely meets the criteria in its scope and in its message not only to the disciples, but to mankind at large of what Christ came to do. The Bible tells us here in John 14, 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, arise, let us go hence. In that one verse of Scripture, we find three things about the mission of Christ to die upon the cross. First of all, we'll look at the audience of His mission. And then we'll see the authority of His mission. And lastly, we'll look at the affirmation of His mission. When Jesus said, Arise and let us go hence, He showed His readiness to suffer for the mission that He came to fulfill. When He said, Arise and let us go hence, He was saying, I will not wait for the enemy to come to where I am. I will go and meet him. I am ready to go to the place where Judas will uh, meet me and where Judas will betray me and where Judas will be looking for me. He said, I'm ready. Arise, let us go hence, and I will go into the garden where I shall agonize, and my sweat shall become as great drops of blood. And he says, Arise, let us go hence, that I'm willing to go to Calvary where I will die for the sins of the world. Jesus did not undertake this mission in ignorance. But the Bible tells us that He came to fulfill the will of God. And Jesus never repented of the work that He was sent to do. But rather the Bible reminds us in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 that He loved us and gave Himself for us. Jesus had no inconsistency in His mission. For the Bible tells us that He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And He always had the victory of the mission because he had the power to complete it. Jesus said in John chapter number 10 beginning in verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So in this 31st verse of John chapter 14, let's look at these three thoughts tonight in a form of a message. Number one, the audience of His mission. But that the world may know that I love the Father. In that verse, in that portion of that verse, we find the audience of His mission. Whom did Christ come for? And for whom did Christ suffer? And for whom did Christ die? The Bible reveals that answer. And that answer can be found in one word. World. 
That's the audience of the mission of Jesus Christ. When God sent forth His only begotten Son into this world to die for the sins of the world, He did not do it in secret. He did not do it in hiding. He didn't come privately and no one knew He was here and no one, was, no one knew what He was doing and then He quietly and privately went back to heaven. No, He did it in full view of all of the world. He says, but that the world may know that I love the Father. John said in John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What did Jesus show the audience of His mission? Well, He showed the audience of His mission three things. He shows us these three things as He was completing His mission. Number one, Jesus died to show the love of the Father to sinful men. The Bible tells us that God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. In that verse, in that word commendeth, that word means to put on display. And so God put on display His great love for you and for me and for all of mankind by placing His Son in full public view in Jerusalem on Mount Calvary by the main road running through Jerusalem that all may see. The Romans thought that by putting Jesus on that cross in that location of execution, uh, that people would see <clears throat> this is an example of Roman justice and this is what will happen to you if you go up against Rome. That might have been Rome's intention, but God had a greater intention. He wanted to show man how much he loved him and how far he was willing to go in order for you to be a part of the family of God. Jesus died to show the love of the Father to sinful men. But not only that... Uh, Jesus, in fulfilling His mission, showed His audience that He was here to substitute for sinful men. He said, I'm here, I'm going to that cross, and when you see me hanging on that cross, beaten beyond human recognition, my vigils shall be so marred more than any man. The prophet Isaiah had said 700 years before, he said, when you see me hanging there, beaten and bruised and bloodied and dying, I want to show you something. Not only do I want to show you the love of the Father, but I want to show you what I'm doing for you because I'm up here on this cross in your place as your substitute. The nation of Israel understood the sacrificial lamb. They did that on Yom Kippur Day. They would get that lamb and take that lamb and that lamb would be slaughtered by that high priest and the blood applied to that mercy seat in the holiest of all. They understood the principle. But what they didn't get was that when Jesus was hanging on that cross, He was the Lamb of God being sacrificed, but He was also the high priest of God making the sacrifice. And that sacrifice on Calvary as a substitution for you and for me and for all the sins of the world was going to be a one-time thing and it was the final sacrifice that God would ever require to pay for sin. The audience, we watched the drama unfold. There were those who were there physically that lived in that day who were there and watched that drama unfink back legs or to raise the dead back to life. Maybe some thought, oh, he's just here and he's got some power and he can feed multitudes with just a little bit of food. Whatever they thought, whatever they saw and misunderstood, Jesus had no misunderstanding of why He was here. He was here to die for the sins of the world. And so when He left that upper room, when He said that the Father gave me commandment, as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, I understand what I've come to do. Do you understand why you're here tonight? Do you understand why God has left you here? Now, if He has saved your soul, 
He's got something for you to do. If not, He would have just took you on to heaven when He saved you. But He's got a work for you to do. Can you say the words of Christ in your own personal life and walk with God? That as the Father hath given me commandment, even so I do. Do you understand that God has required something of you? If you haven't, you can come. You can come tonight and get on the altar and say, Lord, what is it that you have for me in my life? We just heard a man stand up here. Him and his wife are involved in a ministry. They know specifically what they're supposed to do. They have a good understanding of it. And they're fulfilling it the best way they can uh, with the help of the Lord. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know why I'm here. I know what God is having me to do. And we try to follow Him every day and, and follow His leadership. I'm not the leader. The Lord Jesus is the leader. I'm the under-shepherd. Amen? I'm just over this flock. And I'm accountable to God. Say amen again. But Jesus understood the requirements. Even so I do. I understand the commandments. But secondly, the, in the affirmation of his, miss, of his mission, we also see that Jesus understand, understood the urgency of His mission. He understood the urgency of His mission. He said, arise. He didn't say we're going to do this next week or we're going to put it off to next year. We're not going to wait till the moon's just right or, or we got enough money in the bank or... We don't have anything else to do and then we'll get started. Jesus said, no, my hour has come. The prince of this world is now upon me and it is now time for me to go and die for you. I know what I'm supposed to do. He says, now rise. The time is now to begin serving God. If you're not, the time is now to continue serving God with full fervency as we approach the finish line. Third thing. And that was Jesus understood the requirement of faithfulness. The requirement of faithfulness. Did you know that every child of God is required? Paul told us that. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians. He says that we're stewards. And that as stewards, it is required that we, to be, we are to be faithful. Every one of us in this auditorium and under the sound of my voice and those watching over the internet, God requires us to be faithful. But if you hold an office in this church, if you hold a position in this church, you should have the burden in your heart that you are to settle for nothing less an absolute faithfulness. Because as one in authority over anything in this church, myself included, our faithfulness is looked at. Our faithfulness is seen by the entire congregation. Well, I thought they were supposed to be so and so and they never come to church or they don't do this or they don't do that or they don't do the other. Well, if they as leaders are not faithful, then how can the pastor possibly expect me to be faithful? Jesus Christ understood the requirement of faithfulness. And so as he arose from that seated position, after that Lord's Supper and after that dreadful night, he looks at those men and he says, that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father has given me commandment, even so I do. Arise. Let us go hence. Who will go with Christ tonight in faithful living? Who will go with Christ tonight and fulfill the mission that God has given to you. Jesus fulfilled His. May we follow Him in like manner. Let's bow our heads in prayer. 
Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the Word of God tonight and this verse that shows us the mission, your mission, that you fulfilled upon this earth. And Lord, that mission is our mission, for we are to carry that gospel, whether it be through printed Bibles to South America, whether it be through internet ministry around the world, personal evangelism right on the streets of our town. Lord, may we hear and respond to the commandments you have for our life. May we do it. May we arise now and go forth. As we have a song of invitation played, Lord, we'll ask the congregation to stand to their feet with their heads bowed and their eyes closed. Lord, if you've touched their heart, I pray they'll not walk off and leave you. But they'll come to this altar and say, Lord, I'll follow you. Lord, I'll take up that commandment. Lord, I'll arise and go hence. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name.